So good to see you tonight, and uh, I always look forward to New Year's Eve because I know that God has something specific to speak to us. We come with that, uh, that kind of an anticipation, and I, I want to just uh, briefly give some insight to uh, what would be an understanding of going into another year. Uh, my background has been even from uh, when I was uh, newly saved, a new Christian, we would have what would be called a watch night service, and uh, I would go to it as a new Christian, and I remember hearing the preaching and God speaking to my heart, and uh, I, I realized that, that God knows whether you're using the Jewish calendar or the Gregorian calendar, God knows the times and the seasons, and he knows when to shift them, when to extend them. And it's no secret because he's the one who said it was uh, spring, summer, fall, winter. You know, like he knows all about that. And so uh, we have gone through a decade, 57 70s on the Jewish calendar. And the 70 was the uh, letter, uh, each of the Hebrew uh, letters of the alphabet have numerical value. The 70 has the numerical value uh, uh, for the letter ayin, and it has the shape of an eye. And so all for the last 10 years, it's been the eye, the eyes of God looking upon people and for ourselves uh, that we would have eyes to see. And so that was the last decade. Now we're in what's called... Uh, the 5780, the first year, 5780. And uh, for uh, the 80, the reason why uh, people would speak of this year uh, as being really significant more than another year is eight is a number that speaks of new beginnings, uh, a change. But 80 is much more than that. And so you'll hear uh, people speak of, this isn't just a new beginning, this is a new era. And so very significant things have transpired to uh, this watch night service prior to it, prior to the meeting tonight. Uh, changes have already been in motion for the last number of months. Your life would have been changed, many of you already. For some it will you say, well, it hasn't changed yet. It will have had that uh, kind of uh, explosion of change coming into it. You watch. It will be that way. And when people speak that in a very definitive way, in other words, it's intentional, they're referring to 5780. 80 being the time of new beginnings, but exponentially much greater change. And so significant things are taking place. You'll notice it. It's not where you'd have to sit down and say, I wonder if anything has happened. You would notice those changes. I want you to know just before I get into the actual message that when you speak of 5780, in other words, Jewish people believe that the earth is 5,780 years old. That's where that comes from. And so the uh, letter that corresponds to the numerical value of 80 is the Hebrew letter Pei, P-E-Y, Pei. And you'll see it on the screen. And the Pei, it's in red. You'll see it's in the shape of not an eye, but a mouth. And it's not referring to how you would eat food, but it's referring to a decade specifically of how you would speak. A decade being influenced and being able to give guidance and being able to give direction and being able to adjust your life 
according to the words of your mouth. Now, on the one hand, there's nothing new to that. The Bible uh, speaks in numerous places that what we say from our mouths will direct us. People who aren't even Christians, they, they haven't asked Jesus to come into their life. They don't read the Bible. They, they acknowledge that, listen, the rudder for your life is what you say. You say something enough, it will direct your life. Well, this is 5780. It's the year and decade of the pay. It's the mouth. And what we want to do is talk about tonight what it is about our mouths. Besides simply saying, listen, you know, if uh, we're maybe new Christians, it's watch your mouth. Don't just say anything. If we're older Christians, it would be, listen, we need to have good confessions and declarations over our lives, our families, our church, our nation, whatever it is. And so it's that we would uh, watch our mouths and what we say. It's the, the letter pay, the shape of a mouth. All through this decade, you will see the influence of your mouth. Wouldn't it be great if we could just say tonight, listen, it's the decade of the mouth. Why don't we just watch our mouths this decade? James chapter 3 tells us that most of us, maybe 99.9% .9 of us, can't watch our mouths for the next hour. Person who can watch your mouth, you're, you're a mature Christian. So we're talking about something that is very important. I want you to go to a place in the Bible. I suppose, I haven't heard anything, but I, I, I just think that when you have a message title like this, the year of the talking donkey, and understanding that the King James Version doesn't use the word donkey, it uses three other letters, and I, I, I can imagine people having fun with that, so if anyone wants to get over that, take just a couple of seconds, have a good hearty laugh, and then I want to lead you into the message for tonight. Because it is the year of the talking donkey. There's a story in the Bible, predominantly it's found in three chapters in the Old Testament book of Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I'll give you a moment to find it. It's Numbers, and we're going to begin at chapter 22. This story is in chapter 22, chapter 23, and chapter 24. This is really the, the bulk of the story of a couple of main characters, and one of them includes a donkey. In chapter 22, in your Bibles, do you have it? Say yes. Okay. In chapter 22, we begin being introduced to the people of Israel who were released from captivity in Egypt. They've moved from Egypt, they're going through the desert, and they're winding their way up northward, they're northeast, and they're going to eventually cross the Jordan River, and they're going to go into and occupy what is now called Israel. And so the journey of the Israelites is to leave Egypt, Moses is going to lead them, then finally Joshua is going to uh, lead as well. And they'll wind their way up northeast of the Jordan River. And every place that they go, they have victory. God either tells them, listen, these are your relatives. And I don't want you to fight with them. Or God says, listen, I want you to defeat them. And because God is with them and taking them on the journey and the destiny... It's a certainty that this group of people, three to five million people, who are called Israelites, who have as their father and mother Abraham and Sarah, they're going to work their way up 
right up to a country called Moab. Moab is on the eastern side of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. And the king of Moab, king, you'll, you'll see it here in chapter 22, Balak, King Balak, has heard of the Israelites. Um, you'll pick it up in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 22. He's heard about the Israelites and he figures, listen, there are some nations that were stronger than us who were conquered by the Israelites and so we don't stand a chance. And so he gets on his iPhone and he looks up, rent a prophet. And while he goes and he finds a place where you can actually hire a prophet and he sees that this fellow's name is Balaam. Balaam the prophet. Now I'll tell you this at, at the outset. Balaam is an accurate prophet, but he's a wicked prophet. Accuracy isn't everything. He actually has a deep, deep motivation in what he does to get money. And he tries to not admit it here, but he's actually after the money. And when he's asked about the money, he says, no, 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 it's, it's, it's not about the money at all. And uh, Balak says, listen, I want you to come with me and I want you to curse the Israelites. I want you to curse them so that they can't come through Moab, my country, they can't destroy us and they wouldn't be able to get into what is now named Israel. So Balaam is the kind of a prophet, you know, he, he says, well, you know, I'd have to think about this. Here, I thought about it. Maybe we can work something out. It's probably not a good thing for me to do to curse the Israelites, so I probably won't. But here, well, just a minute. Let me see if I can curse the Israelites. And God sees the deepest part of his heart and understands what's going on. Balaam is actually going to end up giving four different prophecies. At one point, God says, don't go. Balaam kind of, you know, says this, says that. You know, I really feel I'd like to. And finally, God says, listen, you've angered me, but go ahead. But you will not curse them. You'll bless them. I'll tell you right off the top. This year and this decade is a year and decade of blessing, but there's warfare built into it, and it's not a scary warfare if you understand how to fight. And so Balaam says, I'd like to go with you, King Balak, and let's just have a look at see what God would give me. And I want you to look specifically in chapter 22 and verse 21. There are two huge truths in this one verse. They're hidden. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. From verse 21 down to verse 33, the word donkey is mentioned 14 times. There are different kinds of Bible translations that you have. Some of them, my Bible translation simply says donkey. Your Bible translation or version may be even more specific. It's not just a donkey because this truth wouldn't come out if it was just a donkey. It's not any old donkey. This donkey is a she donkey, a female donkey, not a male donkey. What's the difference? Well, the male donkey is spelled H-A-M-O-R. A female donkey is spelled A 
A-T-N. Or you can put an O in there. But it's A-T-N. Those are the three Hebrew letters. This is the word that's used here. It says, so Balaam rose and saddled his donkey. A-T-N. I want to have you look on the screen and see the A and the T so that you can have a good look at it here of the first two letters. The A is called the Aleph. It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The T is the Tav, and that's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Very simply, here are the first two letters of this female donkey. Ordinarily, I'd preach something like this, but I want to just go slower and open it up so that you can see it. The first two letters of this three-letter word of the female donkey is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The pictograph for the first letter is an ox. The last letter of the Hebrew alphabet is an X. It's a mark. And it's what a good plowing farmer would do. He'd have his ox and he'd look way across the field at the mark and he'd go like this. Keeping his eye on the mark. There are lots of ways to get to a mark. I've seen some people who cut their grass, and I'm certain they were drunk when they were cutting their grass. And then I've seen others, and it's like this, and then a little corner by the flowers, like this. And you think, did that person do that with scissors? I'm like, it's an amazing work of art. The last letter of this female donkey, an A, an Aleph, the first letter. The Tav, the last letter. Pardon me, the second letter, but it's the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The third letter of this female donkey, before I show you, I'll explain something, is an N. It's called a, a Nun. You don't have to know about it, you'll see it in a moment. If it's at the beginning of a word or in the middle of a word, it's a squiggly little line. You'll see it. But if it's at the end of a word, like it is in this female donkey, have a look at what it looks like. Have a look at it. The final nun. You see the nun up there, if it's at the beginning or the middle, it's, it's squiggly. But if it's at the end of a word... It's a straight line. This is a female donkey, and the picture is this, alignment. It's an ox that is going toward a mark, and it's aligned. It's a straight line. Alignment is going in a straight line. To be aligned to experience alignment in your life. It's to be aligned with those around you, not just in your family, but you want students who attend school and they're aligned with their teacher. They're aligned with their principal. You want to have people in society who are aligned with their prime minister. They're aligned with the police. They're aligned with the whole societal norms of how to conduct themselves in a respectful way. It's to be aligned. The alignment that's being spoken of here, and it comes out in verse 21, is this. We need to, as individuals, all the time, but especially in this decade, be aligned with heaven. Heaven has a pattern for your life, for my life, for our church, for what God wants to do at this time in, in uh, human history, 2020. It's an alignment with heaven. It's an alignment with the Word of God. I know people who have squiggly lines in their life. They're not aligned with the Word of God. They just think, I think I should do this. I think this is okay. 
And you can have an argument with them if you want, but our society has pluralism in it. And it's a respectful pluralism. In other words, you do what you want and I'll do what I want and let's try not to bother each other because I might sue you eventually if you're, you be mean to me. Sure. I'm saying it very quickly, but that's it. But there's an alignment of the Word of God. How a person can give their lives to Christ. How a good home can be strengthened. How finances can flourish. Proper relationship, work ethics. All of these things are alignments with the Word of God. What church should look like. You don't have to get a squiggly line staying awake at night thinking, wonder what we should do at church next. There is a straight line. An Aleph, a Tav, a Mark. This ox walking toward the Mark. And a straight line. It's an alignment. This is a year and a decade like no other to know the alignment that you have with God and others, to be aligned properly and not just to be on your own. Now, the second little truth here is this. It says, Balaam saddled his donkey. What makes that so unusual is that Prophets don't saddle their donkeys. Their servants do. You'll read in the next uh, verse, actually several verses. Uh, verse 22, it says, and his two servants were with him. But Balaam saddled his donkey. It has in it this picture, this saddling of the donkey. It means being bound to. It means wrapping yourself around it. It means not only are you aligned to God, but you are being bound to God's purposes. You'll only do what God wants you to do. Verse 21 is a threshold verse of Balaam, who's an actual wicked prophet, but God still wants to use him, not because I don't think it was his first choice, but Balaam wants to be used, and so through accuracy, we'll see how Balaam wants to curse the people of Israel to get the money from King Balak, but God wants him to be aligned with God's purposes. God wants Israel to be blessed. God wants the purposes of God to be bound around Balaam so that when he begins to prophesy and understand that prophecy at this time is what you say will come to pass. Uh, there, there's a whole understanding that we need to have. There are some people who try to curse you and if you laugh it off, there are some occasions, and I'll, hopefully I'll, I'll talk about it just a little bit, at some point in, in this pre, uh, message tonight, but there are curses that actually can happen. And in the same way, there are blessings. In other words, what comes out of the mouth can have such life on it and inspiration that it can create evil or good. This is the way it begins where God is speaking to Balaam. It appears when you look at this, you learn something immediately. Balaam's donkey is aligned with the purposes of God. Balaam's donkey is tied into wanting to obey God. Balaam is not aligned with God, his purposes, and he has not wrapped around his prophetic life being willing to speak easily the things that God has. And so I'll just read a couple of verses here and we'll catch it. It's the strangest story you might have ever heard other than maybe Jonah and the whale. I have no problems with this, neither should you. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord. Who's the angel of the Lord? This is God the Son in the Old Testament. It's Jesus Christ prior to the incarnation through the Virgin Mary. 
It's the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, comes as an angel of the Lord. The donkey sees the angel of the Lord. And the angel of the Lord is standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, and the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. Why does the donkey, when he sees the angel of the Lord with a sword, why does he walk away into a field? Because he knows that Balaam is trying to do the wrong thing. He's not aligned properly, and the donkey's smarter than Balaam. The donkey is in alignment with God. The irony is, it's a stupid old donkey. But the donkey is smarter than the prophet. And so the donkey walks into the open field, which really ticks off the prophet. Verse 24, Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards, with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. Why would the angel of the Lord do that? Because when someone's not in alignment, you try to shore them in. You try to bring them in. Verse 25. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall so that Balaam struck the donkey again. Balaam is ticked off at the donkey. And every time the donkey moves away from Balaam's purposes, which aren't in alignment with God, Balaam beats the donkey. Literally. Verse 27. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused. And he struck the donkey with his staff. I would have been phoning the SPCA. (laughs) Animal cruelty. Beating the donkey mercilessly. The donkey understands the purpose of God and actually sees God the Son. The prophet who's supposed to be a person who's going to give a word of God is mad at the donkey and is becoming emotionally a wreck. Verse 28. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. This is when it gets real good. Like when animals start to talk, You're either watching the cartoon Shrek or you're reading the Bible. Personally, you didn't ask for this. This is just my opinion, okay? Personally, I don't believe that it was the animal donkey talking. I believe that God actually spoke through the donkey. That it's really God speaking. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, verse 28... And she said to Balaam, see, she said, this one who has alignment, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Can you imagine an animal turns to you and says, why do you treat me like that? What have I ever done to you? I'm like, it's an incredulous story. Verse 29, and Balaam said to the donkey, this is even more amazing. Balaam's not phased that a donkey's talking to him. That's an amazing thing. Uh, Probably Balaam, because he did move in sorcery and, and witchcraft and all of that sort of thing, he probably was very familiar with these kind of interactions, and I won't say a lot more about that. But it says, verse 29, Because you have, Balaam says to the donkey, because you have abused me, I wish there was a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. Here again is the irony. Balaam says, if I had a sword, I'd kill you. God the Son says, I have a sword and I'm ready to kill you. 
the donkeys in alignment with heaven's purposes for the children of Israel to move from Egypt and into the promised land. Balaam, the prophet, doesn't get it. Verse 30. So the donkey says to Balaam, am I not your donkey in which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? It's almost like, you know, ever since I was just a little, I, I don't know what a young donkey is called, a foal, I guess, a baby donkey. Every, like it's very heart touching here. Ever since I was a little baby donkey, I always did what you wanted me to do. To this day, was I ever disposed to do this to you? Balaam says, no, now that I think of our relationship, it's, it's been very friendly. You've always obeyed me. By the way, I'm reading from the Bible still. <laughs> then the Lord, verse 31, opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head, fell flat in his face. The angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. The donkey saw me and turned aside these three times. Balaam has been trying to figure out how he can curse the Israelites to get the money. The donkey the ATN, the straight line, the one that pursues alignment, the one who is bound and wrapped around or saddled with the purposes of God and wants to fulfill the pleasures of heaven on earth in his life or her life. This is what it is. The donkey wants to do it, but Balaam doesn't. Finally, in verse 38, it says this, And Balaam said to Balak, Look, I've come to you. Now, have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. It's the year of the talking donkey. It's the year of, if you say the right thing that heaven is saying, the blessing cannot be withheld from you. If, you. if you speak the wrong things, neither will you be able to see the right things. The donkey was able to walk in the purposes of God and was able to see the angel of the Lord. Finally, God opened Balaam's eyes. And Balaam realized, I'm actually battling God himself. If you turn over now to chapter 23, you'll see that in the second prophecy that Balaam gives, and every time he stands up to give a prophecy, Balak has got his suitcase loaded with American dollar bills, $100 bills, and says, I'm ready to pay you. In fact, he asks his princes, you know, if the problem is I don't have enough money, try to figure it out uh, with Balaam. Because if, if it's just a matter of money, we can get more money. And so Balaam stands up, and you're never sure what he's going to do. But God, sure. God gives the words in his mouth. And the words are this. He stands up and he blesses Israel. Do you know one of the nations of the world that you want to be aligned with if you're a nation is what? Israel. All of the other nations are important. God loves the whole world. But if you don't align yourself properly with Israel, it's the difference between a bless or a curse. Fascinating, the alignment. It's not smarter, not harder. It's not smarter or harder. It's aligned with what God's saying and wrapping yourself and being bound to it 
And notice this. It's in verse 21 of chapter 23. God has not observed iniquity in Jacob. That is, God has not seen sin in the people of Israel, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of the king is among them. The king is God himself. In other words, the strength of Israel is the presence of the king in their midst. And God says, as long as you honor me and have me as the God of this nation, no one will be able to stand in front of you and you will move into the promised land. You'll move into the territory that I have set out for you. You will be blessed. You will not be cursed. You say, and this is where I wanted to just talk for a moment about people who have curses. I've been to some nations of the world where they curse and it happens. It's voodoo, it's witchcraft. I've seen people do it in North America who curse and they try to, to cause some kind of calamity to come upon you. And here's how much you need to worry about it. If your life is in alignment with the living God, if your life is wanting to be in al alignment with the Scriptures and walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and honor Holy Spirit in your life, it says this, verse 23, For there is no sorcery against Jacob or Israel, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, oh, what God has done. It's saying this, go ahead and get your little voodoo dolls out. Get your needles out and poke the doll and say, that's Israel. Go ahead and say, I curse this and curse that. God says, won't work. Won't work. No curse will come upon them. I've had a couple, not many, a couple. I don't even relay the story because it's like I would become too familiar or cavalier with it. But I knew this. I knew this. It was the one thing that kept fear out of my heart. I knew that my life was right with God. The curse wouldn't work. You can do all the chanting and all your stuff, and when it's done, I'll still be standing. It's the same as yourself. It's the same as yourself. It's a fact. You're not trying to tempt God in any way. You're not trying to go where angels haven't sent you. But literally, you do not have to be afraid of a curse. Balaam has been trying to get a curse out of his lips. And every time he goes like this, just opens his mouth, Balak is thinking, yes, I'm going to get a curse out of him finally. And then after Balaam speaks, he blesses Israel some more. And Balak goes, Tow! you know, he learned that from Bart Simpson. Just can't believe it. Chapter 23. Finally in chapter 24, I'm pulling it together. Balak says, listen, what we need to do is go on top of this mountain area. It's the area where Moses died. I want you to look out across, uh, across the Israelite uh, nation, all the people of Israel. I want you to stand there and curse them. Just speak a curse out. Notice verse 2. I'll, I'll read 2 down to 4 of chapter 24. And Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel... So he raises his eyes, he sees Israel encamped according to their tribes. You know what that's called? Order and alignment. Being in the right place at the right time with the right people and you're lined up and you're in the order that God has designed for Dan, Naphtali, Zebulun, Judah, Levi. He's got them all lined up. Encamped according to their tribes. And what happens when there is this alignment and this order? And the Spirit of God came upon him. Doesn't mean that he's a Christian. Spirit of God comes upon him. 
Spirit of God wants to accomplish something here. Listen to these words. Then he took up his oracle. This is Balaam now. This, this is our, this is our, our guy who is, who is trying to get a curse out and you know, walk away with the grand prize and he can't pull it off. Verse 3, and he said this. The utterance of uh, chapter 24, verse 3. The utterance, the utterance, the word, the mouth of Balaam, the son of Beor. The utterance, the peh of the man whose eyes are opened. You see, when you speak the right thing, when you're aligned properly, you'll see. If you don't speak the right things, you will not see. Verse 4, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. Isn't that the most unusual portion of Scripture? When your mouth is working right, when you're speaking the way God wants you to talk, when there's order in your life, and you're able to say, I want to follow heaven's pattern." We're not talking about perfection. We're not talking about you've done everything right. We're talking about people who want to walk in alignment with the Lord, who want to walk in in alignment with the Scriptures, who want to walk in alignment with the body of Christ. It says this, that when you're speaking that way, you'll see things that other people won't see. You think to yourself, well, how come I can see them and they can't? Am I smarter? Not at all. Well, you might be, but not at all. What it really is, is if you bring your mouth into alignment with God, he'll allow you to see things of the invisible. Here's what he says in verse 5. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, or Israel. Jacob is another name for Israel. Your dwellings, O Israel. Does, Does lovely mean... It was a beautiful china set for some tea and the little biscuits were lovely. No, that's not the word that's used here. It's how good. Show it on the screen, this picture that Balaam saw as he looks out across this nation of Israel and he looks out there and he sees, some will call it the shape of a cross, maybe so, but it's the mark. It's the alignment of Israel. And Balaam Balaam again begins to speak. And Balak's thinking, I've got another chance. We'll get a curse out of this guy yet. And Balaam just brings more blessing upon Israel. Until finally he says this in the last part of verse 9. It's blessed is he who blesses you and cursed is he who curses you. Basically, he's saying Balak is trying to curse you, and he's cursed. He's in big trouble. That's what's being said here. And then he goes into even the latter days, verse 14. I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. Verse 17, he says, I see him. There's there's someone who's going to arise in the future. He's talking to Israel. He says, I see him, but not now. There's someone that I see, but that person won't come now. I behold him, but not near. In other words, not close to me right now. It's for another time. A star shall come out of Jacob. Matthew picks this up in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 9 when the Magi come who also were supernatural prophetic people but pagan people and they come as Magi to worship the star coming out of the east. It goes all the way back to Balaam speaking prophetically here. Here's what we see for 2020. Some people call it 2020, you know, clear vision. Sure, let's go for that. 80, not just a little bit of a new beginning, but some great, great, huge changes taking place. Expect significant changes. Either you've had a significant change in your life in the last several months, three to six months, or you're entering into it. 
That's what it is. Is it to curse you? No, it's for good. Will there be warfare against the good, the blessing that God has for you? Yes. Do you have to worry about a curse upon your life or somebody cursing you? No. Why? Because you don't have to be smarter or harder. You just need to be aligned properly with the Lord. You just need to be aligned. Some people are too good for church. They say, I'm not going to be aligned with a, a church body. I, you know, I, I just watch television. There's some great preachers on there. Not aligned. There's some people who say, well, here's what I'm going to do with guidance for my life. Here's what I'm going to do with finances for my life. Here's what I'm going to do with this relationship. I don't care about what the Bible says. See how it works for you. It won't. You're looking at the manual. Now, Let me finish with this. This alignment, not a squiggly line, but a straight line, is the kind that is supposed to get the Israelites into the promised land. And here's what needs to be seen because it's not often talked about. It's not about my life or your life. This was corporate It was an alignment for the body of Christ. It was an alignment for Israel. It was alignment for tribes, a tribe to be settled over there, a tribe of Israel to be settled over there. And it's it's not even one church says, sometimes one church will say, well, you know, we've got this and we've got this and we're the best at that and everybody should just look at what we have. That's nowhere close to what the alignment of blessing is supposed to be. It's what God has for all of us. And there's a pattern, a pattern in heaven, and it's called, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just for a moment, for Elena and Peter, I just want to speak to you, Elena and Peter, for, for the situation that you would desire to have changed and you want the purposes of God, this is an assault of the enemy to leverage a situation that the enemy has taken the alignment away. And when the alignment is lost, then the enemy is able to breed and bring confusion. And what needs to be restored is the spoken words, the peh, the eighty, the words of the mouth, and the words of the mouth are meant to bring honor, are meant to bring order, and are meant to bring alignment. And when that takes place, how beautiful is, are the people, Psalm 133, are the people of God. The beauty of God's presence there is like an oil that's been poured on the head and goes from the head all the way down. That's the kind of an alignment that God has. And I speak it tonight. I declare it for Elena and Peter. In your situation that you want to be used in, I declare it the alignment on December 31st 2019, let there be an alignment of the purposes of God and where honor is restored, order is restored, and the blessings are able to come because the enemy isn't able to put some prophet out for hire. And so we cut that off in Jesus' name, and I bless, I bless, I bless. And when some people can't see and they try to forge ahead, the Bible says even donkeys are able to see. And they'll go to a field. They'll go into a vineyard. What are they trying to do? Trying to carry Balaam to a place where he'll realize, listen, be short in, be short in. I bless in Jesus' name and declare it. Amen. Amen. There are people here tonight, I'm going to ask you to stand in just a moment. 
I've talked about alignment. I've given some practical points of it could be your marriage. It could be your finances. It can be your home. The whole idea is that there's to be an alignment. It can be at, at your business. There are all of these different things. But there are some people here tonight, the real issue is this. The way that it came to me is I heard there are some who are trying to do an end run. And an end run is when you start somewhere and you try to end up over there, but you don't go through the process. In other words, that aleph, that ox, is meant to plow the field and go straight right to where the mark is. You don't take your plower over there, put it in the back of a pickup truck, and drive around to the, the end there and then plunk it down. And it's, it's not that you're trying to do wrong, but your end has not been the Lord. Your end has been the purpose. And a purpose is never good enough. It's Jesus. If the end isn't Jesus... The Apostle Paul said it this way, who had lots of purposes in his life and assignments and callings and mantles. He said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I forget those things that are behind. I'm pressing toward the mark of Jesus Christ. Don't complicate it. Don't complicate it. There are some people here tonight, you've been trying to get something. And one of the ways that you know that it's going to come another way, there's got to be an easier way, is that no matter what you do, you can't get it. It's because it's just needing the alignment for Jesus Christ. Somehow, I'll call it an idol because that's what those things become. It's the be-all and end-all. You'll do anything, and I don't mean that in, in a, um, a derogatory way or a put-down, but it's, it's like you're trying your best to get to the the mark. And God says, if you'd make me the mark, you'd find that all of this will follow. Matthew 6 and 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. If you're here tonight, and you say, listen, I want to be aligned right now in this service. I want to change my alignment from this thing. It might have been uh, all... It could be all sorts of things. I won't even take the time for it. Just stand up right now, just where you are. Stand up. You say, I, I've had the wrong alignment. It's been some things, and it hasn't been Jesus. Just stand up for a moment, please. The frustration of trying to follow another mark is so intense because you'll never get it. Not because you're not a good person, but you'll never get it because Jesus is the be-all and end-all. He's the beginning and the end. He's the author and the finisher. He's the prize of the high calling, pressing toward the mark. And so tonight, I, I speak in the name of Jesus, where we're speaking of alignments. I speak in the name of Jesus... I, this couple right here, I speak in the name of Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, upon them. Come, Holy Spirit, especially upon them. I just sense that God wants to do something specially in you right now. Just come upon them right now. I bless what you're doing in them right now. There'd be a reverse of the curse. There'd be a blessing where there'd be a flourishing. Only because of alignment. For everyone who's standing, we say, Jesus, you're the one. There's no one like you. You have to be our beginning and, and the ending. Nothing else is worthy of that place. And so we say, Lord, let your power come and melt these things like wax in the presence of the Lord. These idols, we cast them down in Jesus' name, that nothing would stand in the presence of God that Jesus Christ would reign supreme. We're talking about a person. We're talking about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the alignment would come. The joy of walking towards Jesus. The pleasure 
of being able to plow in the ground where Jesus says, keep your eyes on me and I'll do more for you in one moment than you've been able to do in all of your stressing and fussing and striving. And for some, it can even be conniving. We just cast it down. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, come. Come. Touch these people who are standing right now. I bless in Jesus' name. I bless in Jesus' name. Up in the balconies, I bless, I bless, I bless. The alignment, it'll send you on your assignment and it'll be with joy. You'll do it as unto the Lord. The fruit, the fruit that comes from it is so plenteous and no curse can ever come upon you. Most times when there are those others who try to curse us, it's only because they don't have it. It's one of the ways that people try to lift themselves up. Sometimes it it has a demonic force even attached to it, but it can't come. It can't affect your life. I declare that in Jesus' name. Just towards the back, there's, there's a young man with a a checkered uh, or a striped uh, colors uh, on, on your shirt. I just bless what God's doing in you right now. I bless in the name of Jesus. I don't know how you got here tonight. I don't know everybody who's here, but I don't know how you got here, but you can consider yourself Ecclesiastes, if you know the Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 11. It's not the strength. It's not the wealth. It's not the, the wisdom. But it's time and chance. This is a time when God wants to have an encounter with you and show himself strong in your life. And I bless what he's doing in your life right now. Would you all stand with me, please? Stand with me for a moment. If you just lift your hands, you don't have to. I'm not uh, mandating it. But if you just want to receive tonight, you lift your hands. We say, Lord, let there be an alignment. An alignment in people's homes, in their marriages, that it would be aligned according to the scriptures, that it would be aligned according to heaven's purposes, and that nothing spoken against it would curse it. You don't have to be afraid of that. You don't have to be afraid of it. It seems like it's too good to be true and it's probably going to fall apart like it fell apart before. It won't. It won't. Because this is the the year and the decade of the spoken mouth. We declare it in Jesus' name. New territory. A spacious land. A provision of abundance, of blessing. Why? Because we're in alignment. God's preserved us to take us into the promised land. I declare this upon this house. I declare this upon this city. In Jesus' name. The eyes of the whole nation for months and months have been watching Oshawa. The place of crossing over. There have been numerous people who have tried to curse it and say it's going to fall apart. It won't have this and it won't have that. But it cannot come because there's an alignment that's been sealed, that's been leveraged by a a godly remnant who invite the presence of the Lord in our city that everyone would be blessed. Everyone would be blessed because that's what God has for us. And so we declare that in Jesus' name. I I said to Dr. Russ tonight, I said, if you have a word, I want you to give it. Uh, We'll we'll give you a a microphone here, a a white uh, mic. I said, no matter what it is, one, one of the things that I do is I, I don't tell anybody about my message. I don't want to choreograph something. I want to hear what God says. 
I want to see what it is. And so I'm going to ask Dr. Russ. He, he comes prepared usually on New Year's Eve, and I want you to share just what you have, please. The Lord would say, with alignment comes definement. This is a year when my people will begin to discover their place and identity in me. For I am making all things new as we enter this new era. This is truly a place you have not been before, but know I am releasing my perfect vision on you in your midst. Trust in me, says the Lord, and you will stand firm. Believe the word of the prophets, and you will prosper. For just as in the days when Jehoshaphat saw that his enemies had already fallen, the Lord says, prepare to enter into a restoration of promises and know you are ready to take back plunder that was stolen from you in the past as we advance because your enemies have fallen. Alignment, definement in Jesus' name. Would you just go like this one more time? I declare the identity that God has for you. The identity in the body of Christ, the identity that God had for you when you were born, the identity for the purposes of God that others maybe have cursed or slandered, that there would be the pure identity that would come out January 1, even tonight, of the identity of who you really are, and that in that safe environment of alignment, you would flourish, and this would be the best of times for you in Jesus' name. Pastor Leon Basrai, lead us.